Should we go direct or indirect in anterior cases? That will be the topic of one lecture at the GC November Symposium. In this podcast, I talk with two dentists about this question, which is always causing a lot of discussions. And they actually believe that direct dentistry is the future. If you don't believe it, you better listen to this podcast. Welcome to today's show. I'm here connected with Javier and Marce. I think you both don't need, really need an introduction, but I'm really great that we are here on a Sunday night, guys. Good evening. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Javier, there will be a GC November symposium and you are planning a lecture together with Marlene Paul Oymans. What will be the topic of the lecture? Our topic for the GC symposium is about anterior restorations, direct versus indirect. And I think it's a, it's a nice topic to, to discuss and to have a debate and to have a nice chat about it because there is a lot of possibilities, a lot of dimensions on, on it. So very interesting, I think. In, and we will try to bring some light to this. Of course, it's a limited time, but, uh, but I, I, we will try our best to, to show all the considerations that you, you, we, we normally think about when we are facing this kind of anterior cases. And Marche, you're also known for anterior cases. You even wrote a whole book about it. So you will be moderating the whole symposium. But what are your thoughts when it comes to direct or indirect anterior restorations? What's usually your decision tree? First of all, it's a honor for me, honor for me to be at this symposium as a moderator and introducing great lectures like you, like Javier and all the guys, which will be lecturing in November. But And anteriors, this is a very demanding uh, story because if you make any error, it's uh, immediately possible to notice in the future compared with the posteriors. Posteriors are, both anteriors and posteriors are connected to function. But anteriors are really more easily seen uh, within the errors in the in the future. And I would say in the past I was more connected to the indirect restorations and the in the ceramic veneers because it was easier to do when you have a, a great technician. But in the recent, I think eight maybe maybe eight years, last eight years with, with the improvement in composite materials and also more predictable work that we do with the wax-up, mock-up technique and the silicon indexes and the layering technique and the great composite that we receive also from, from GC uh, company. We received, for example, Essencia in the last years, which is amazing composite. And it's possible to make the composites really predictable. So it's a 50-50% that I choose between direct and indirect. But uh, when I have a young patients, I go into the direct restorations. When I have a single restorations, I go to the direct restorations. When I have asymmetrical restorations, right side or left side, I go to the direct restorations. But when I have very complex cases... I consider indirect restorations as well. Is it say, is the same with you, Javi? Yeah, I agree. I think it's uh, there. Are, of course, there are many factors that we need to consider when when we are choosing direct and indirect. There is there is of course the also not only the age. Of course, the age is a big factor for sure. I mean, we need to understand that the more we touch the tooth, the worse the prognosis on the long term will be. So, uh, you know, I always say something in my lectures and my courses that, uh, unfortunately, the only thing that we can be sure in the industry is that everything we do is going to fail one day, right? So this is the reality. I mean, we cannot, we need to start thinking a little bit of the failure pattern and what are we going to do considering the age of the patient and how many re-interventions these teeth will need. Because it's not the same to consider an elder patient as a young patient when you think about this prognosis on the long term. So 
that's why composite i think is of course the first line you know that you need to the first therapy that you need to look for when when it's a young patient because you don't want to do more irreversible dentistry more uh, preps more uh, you know everything starts going into into this cycle of, of death of the tooth and uh, and that's it so the younger you start the worse future you have but at the same time there is all some other considerations like the structure of the tooth and the, the compromise the biomechanical compromise that you might have because sometimes, of course, you have patients that have a huge defect on the tooth, a big fracture, and then the, the whole stiffness of the, of the residual tissue, it's compromised. And perhaps you need to use indirect restoration just because you, you need to recover a little bit of this structure with something a bit more stiff if you want to have a little bit better result in the future. Also, the, probably one of the biggest inconveniences of the composite is that the part of the color match and the, and the layering and all those needs to be trained, needs to be, you need to have some, some skills, you need to have some training, and not everybody is, is, is on, onto that, really. So a, a lot of times people choose to go indirect just because they have this lack of uh, training into or they don't feel comfortable doing the composites. But, but fortunately, this is something we can always solve with uh, training and with uh, sharing, you know. Also, maybe just sending patient over to all the specialists that can do this, uh, maybe, because we also need to consider that, you know. Unfortunately, I think this is a, a big problem we have in dentistry is that we tend to just um, think that, okay, we need to solve the case in one way or the other, but... The reality is if you know someone that is going to solve the case better than you in this way because you maybe you say, okay, I don't I do not do the composites well, so, okay, then I go indirect. But if that means I need to be more aggressive or more, I don't think that's completely justified, you know, because we have a lot of professionals and we, we should be able to send to a colleague that can do that composite because that's the best for the patient. We need to prioritize also what is the best for the patient. So thinking about all these things together. Sometimes also the economic factor is critical, you know, because not everybody can afford to have uh, treatments done by the technician, by the ceramist, you know, having a good ceramist, for example, doing a good falsepatic ceramic, maybe on a platinum foil or something like that. That's That's going to be a totally different story than doing some direct composite restorations, right? So there is there is really many factors. Then one of the factors that we want to actually cover in the lecture is related to the longevity of, of these restorations and how they age and what's going to be uh, the, the future. I think that Magic uh, really talk about one point that is very, very sp special and very important in this, and is that we, had a, we have a lot of um, articles and research, you know, that it's considering composite versus ceramics but they normally are older composites and not done in the way that we do composites now and the materials and the mechanical properties the polishing the all these things are not exactly the same as we have now so i think that we have much more advanced materials now that have less problems of staining that they can be maintained much better looking after years so uh you know it is not as in the past, I will say. So composite nowadays ages much, much better than in the past. And eventually you can even see cases that in ceramic that they didn't age that well. You know, So uh, this is the funny thing is when you start looking at long-term cases, you might find cases that they look better with composites than with ceramics because after 10, 15 years, you can be surprised, you know, ceramic might not look so good anymore. Huh? Because you know what happens is we consider always the aging of the material. So ceramic does not age. Ceramic is just staying like that, you know. It doesn't change color, doesn't change much, maybe a little bit of wear on the surface, of course. But the rest of the mouth is aging. So there is going to be a mismatch between the age of the patient and the age of the veneers because the veneers are like static, you know, no, nothing changes there. And the rest of the patient has changed. The lower teeth or the other the adjacent teeth are changed. And this is something that the composite can withstand much better, you know.
because it also ages a little bit. So they kind of blend even in the long term. They still can blend if they are maintained in, in a proper way. You know, patient is brushing with very aggressive toothpaste and they keep the glossy appearance. You have some, some little maintenance of the materials. They can last and they can still be quite decently integrated after many years. And I don't think you can see that same feeling, you know, with, with a very long-term ceramic because aesthetically it's going to be very visible. Javi, you always mention in your courses and lectures one toothpaste you like when it comes to direct anterior composites can you mention them for all the listeners yeah for sure i think all in general i mean you can of course look at the granulometry and so on but normally they don't give you this data but it's very simple to see that this toothpaste that become very creamy you know and soft like normally for uh, sensitive teeth like sensodyne and all this you know this this kind of toothpastes are very small particle and they actually help polishing composites so you can keep your gloss you know you can keep and it's a huge difference when you consider this this uh, toothpaste some patients can really destroy the composites because they use so aggressive toothpaste you know bleaching or with a very big granulometry very aggressive and even today it is even worse with with the problem of this natural toothpastes you know that you can buy on this uh, organic shops and you know and it's it's basically like earth you know it's like a kind of earth so the, the particle size you can imagine the grains are huge so this can even wear the enamel like crazy you know so uh, if you advise properly the patient and and they they really wash their teeth with with a toothpaste that it's helping the polishing you can keep a high gloss on your composites and not being aggressive, you know, and, and, and that's, that is for sure helping on the, on the prognosis of, of how it will look after years. That's for sure. Machi, do you also, also see that composite is not that bad in the long term? The composite is great for the long term, in my opinion, because it's, you can service it. You, I, I mean, it's, it's possible to repair. It's repairable. So even if you have any chipping, The chippings are because of problems with the function that probably we didn't notice, and we can improve it, and we can we can uh, really fix it in five minutes. The, the the problem. But I would like to mention one more. Talking about indications and contraindications, I would I would like to say that there is a huge difference, in my opinion, between upper and lower jaw. While in the upper jaw, you have indication for both direct composite and ceramics, in the lower jaw, it's a typical indication for me for a composite. Why? Because when you place a ceramic veneer in the lower jaw, in anteriors, it's impossible to fix and improve the problem of functional envelope. The functional envelope it's impossible to solve this problem within the articulator. You always have to improve something and correct something. While you correct the composite restorations, they become more beautiful with corrections, more natural. While you correct the ceramic veneers, you destroy the layer, outer layer, which means you destroy the final beauty of the veneers. In my opinion, the composite venues in the lower jaw with improving the function and when, you, when the patient is chewing the articulation paper and you are cont controlling the functional envelope and you are changing the outer, the surface of the, of the final layer of the composite and you are correcting them, You're improving the beauty. And the, the, with the ceramic veneer, it's, it's totally disaster when you are doing the corrections. So, so for me, the, the right choice for the lower jaw are the composite veneers, which is very easily correctable. This is very important for, the, for us practitioners. And 
I, w- I would like to say, when you say about the long-term dentistry, the lower anteriors behave really great with the in the composite material compared to the ceramic materials where as i said corrections are leaving the the bad aesthetics because the opaque is showing out from the corrected layer yeah i i agree i think it's uh it's really difficult to make beautiful anterior lowers with ceramics especially with layer ceramics and they are very delicate so it's smaller teeth thinner and normally uh, also i think that the occlusion has a not only the adjustments that you can make but also the incisal edges are much more usually under load so the chances of uh, issues there chipping and all these problems that can happen in ceramics are higher so uh, technically it is it can be quite difficult so i i really think that it's definitely much easier with composite but i think that you can also consider to to do uh, monolithic ceramics you know like uh, instead of going layering you can try some blocks you can try some different options that can also give you some resistance and still give you a chance to correct and then polish and then it's not because it's not a layered block perhaps then it's it's still going to work quite decently but i agree that a layered ceramic if you, you cannot you should not touch it because if you touch it you are destroying it immediately it's like there is no no room for corrections really but there is also one problem with the ceramic material when you start to correct you don't know how much the cer- how much and how thick ceramic it is after corrections Maybe you correct it already, or or the next time you have to correct a little bit more. And at the end, you don't really know if it's tricky or not. With the composite, you can always correct till the end. You're right. So I would like to say that lower ceramic, it's very tricky both for dental technician because of the shape, because of the small size, because of the thickness and because of the function, because lower, lower anteriors they touch in the they touch uh, against the palatal surface of the upper incisors, mm. while the upper usually they don't touch. Usually you don't prepare the palatal surface. You 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 prepare incisal surface, but the lower they have amazing role in the function. And you need to have a great technician and articulators will never work out that great surface in the lower incisors like the function can be evaluated in the real patient. So so you, anyway, the lower incisors have to be always corrected if you want to adapt the function. Look, the orthodontics, it's so many mistakes within the functional envelope and orthodontics. And even after the ortho treatment, the lower incisors need to be corrected. So what's about the dental technicians? They need to be corrected sometimes. Yeah, it's it's true. I mean, you cannot, you cannot think about the upper and lower in the same way because that's it. I mean, the incisal edges and the, even the tips of the canines uh, they are they are basically the position and the and the area it's it's more for statics but the lowers is for function not for aesthetics so if you if you start considering the lower incisal edges just for the aesthetics it's a mistake because the okay. function is the important thing there it's not it's not that much the the aesthetic but but of course the patient always demands you know the the aesthetic improvement also in the lowers so so you agree that corrections in composites are much easier? Yeah, much easier. definitely, definitely. I mean, maybe if you consider blocks like, like for example, uh, the lithium desilicate, like Lisi block, for example, I think it will could be a good option there because you can, you know, correct. You can, and it's still it's a hard material, so it will resist a little bit better than a, just a pure feldspatic. Some reduced thickness, you know, on on this in this area, so. Stronger block is always going to help, but but yeah, it's uh, definitely easier to 
to control and to change and to and the function is is what it is. I mean, it's you need to be always ready for uh, small corrections and small things because I mean, it's it's a life. It's not <laughs> it's not like something fixed, you know. And it it changes and it evolves and it needs adaptation too. So that's it. I mean, I agree with Magic one hundred percent. I think it's it's really a topic that ma- many times we just are like blinded with the beautiful aesthetics of the lower veneers you know with uh but the reality is uh we would like to see those veneers after many years you know because i'm not sure that they are going to perform that well on the long term right this is this is the reality i think that it, it will give you much more issues than than the uppers in general so Actually, I personally never done a ceramic veneer, but I think two times I had patients who lost lower jar ceramic veneers and I have had to redo do them in composite. So it's always <laughs> kind yeah. of fun. <laughs> maybe you are the right person and maybe you are the dentist on the future because uh, in my opinion, for the future, there is one trend toward the direct dentistry. Yes. I'm completely, I'm completely convinced about that because if you are George doing the direct anteriors only by yourself, you are not dependent on dental technician. You are dependent on your errors and your education and your knowledge. And you are limiting the number of the errors to the minimum. So probably this is the right way. Yeah. But one question came to my mind when Javier talked about there are specialists for aesthetics, for example, in Germany. Uh, I wouldn't say any dentist would refer someone for an aesthetic direct composite. Maybe some orthodontics who are not working in the general dentistry field might refer someone to uh, someone, but I wouldn't. Uh, I mean, maybe in Spain it's different, but in Germany it's completely un. Also not possible that ever ever was, I wouldn't say ever, but that someone is referring direct anterior composite to a specialist. Well, it should. And I think that in the future, you might be ch- seeing changes in, on this, right? Because I think it's it's pretty much needed. I mean, there is, there is uh, same as, I mean, if there is a patient coming that needs an implant, what are you going to say? I mean, oh, I, I just referred to my sp- uh, specialist, you know, because... I want to place an implant. So uh, if I have to do an endo, have a, it's it's more towards this direction. If everybody is specializing more and more in, in different in different areas, right? And I think that it's a, it's a problem of considering probably composite like a lower therapy, like a lower thing. And uh, I think that's a mistake because the, the composite is, as Magic says, this is the future of dentistry. It's the first treatment that the patient will have And in many cases, I'll tell you, in many cases will be the last treatment that the patient will have because the oral health is improving a lot in, in globally. And, and we have less and less and less patients that need more and more uh, complex and aggressive treatments. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the treatments that we need to do are a consequence of over-treatments in the past. So uh, I, I really think that the future is is mainly non-touching and also the demand of the patient is I don't want to touch my teeth. I mean, they are, they are learning. They are realizing that of course, when you touch the teeth, uh, everything starts to break down a little bit, you know, and, and people is, is really already more aware uh, of these problems and the long-term issues that you may run into. Uh, of course, the aesthetics sometimes are, overriding everything like people is just thinking about having their white teeth in place and then they don't cannot think about anything else no matter what they do just put me white teeth of course we have patients like, like this too but but in general i will say that there the global conscience of of the people to to be more aware about their personal health to be more uh, you know take care more of their health and that includes also teeth you know I think that's a trend that it's never going to go back. I think people is never going to return to, okay, do whatever you want. If you want to prep my teeth, prep my teeth. No, this is, this is, there is no turning back on this. 
that's it. I mean, we are we are getting there slowly and maybe faster in some countries than others, but that's the future. So the future of dentistry is doing a lot of direct, I'm pretty sure. And the improvement on the adhesive systems, on the strategies, on the materials is, is so good that I think that it's a bright future for these techniques, you know. So I see, of course, that ceramic can have big, it can be very helpful in, in many situations. But but I see that the overall composite is going to win more and more and more space into the daily dentistry in the world. Actually, I kind of was hoping that, yeah, it was in the beginning also like this in Spain, but when you market it this way or when you kind of get a connection to your referring dentists, uh, this helps. But I actually hope that it's the future because I personally like the direct way a lot. But, well, um, I think for me, it's also part of endodontics uh, to do the direct uh, as well. You somehow have to know some shapes to when someone comes with a fracture, but you kind of send them home with a tooth. Yeah, I think, of course, every country has their system. And, of course, in my country, everything is private. Mm. So uh, probably that changes things a little bit, you know. But when it's it's time for aesthetics, that's that's it. I mean, uh, the, what what we need to make is, is that difference. I mean... Why, if you are doing a ceramic veneer, you have a, a fantastic technician behind that is going to make a beautiful layering and all these steps and taking so much care on aesthetics. And you cannot do the same with composite, right? So if you cannot do it because you don't know how to do it or you don't want to do it, why not sending it to another colleague that can do it and is, is really a specialist on doing that? This is this is the point. I mean, I, because otherwise it's like we are considering like, a, okay, that's a lower treatment. Okay, I just put a one monolithic shade and then I don't mind on the anterior. Okay, but maybe the patient demands more. Maybe maybe they don't. Maybe they are happy with just one shade restoration, even if it's not perfect, but it's okay. It It will be enough. And I agree that some patients will be happy with that. But uh, we have more and more demand for aesthetics. So when you have a young patient nowadays that comes to the office with a broken tooth, I tell you, it's not going to be happy with just a, a single monolithic shade, you know, of composite. They will say, okay, it's okay. But they will immediately start looking at someone else to do something better with, with the aesthetics. So because they want a perfect match. I mean, with the young patients today, uh, this trauma patient was probably has the first real exposure to a dental office. Before that, it was just profi and checkup. And uh, after this experience, he might uh, suddenly know what dentistry really is about. Hmm. Absolutely. So, Maciej, do you also see that the young uh, patients are kind of getting more and more demanding? Not only young patients, I think everybody is getting more demanding. <laughs> it's, it's the social media, it's, I would say, how you say, the, the kind of American way and American fashion is get to, to Europe and everybody is looking at the teeth. People are more and more demanding. They want the teeth more and more white, whiter and whiter and more beautiful and bigger and brighter. And they really, they, they are not the same like they were coming 10, 20 years ago to the dentist. Today they are coming better educated. They, they ask, and what, what kind of ceramic are you going to put? Are you going to put lithium desilicate or are you going to, to use zirconia or are you going to use uh, felspatic material or, <laughs> or maybe it's a different one? Or what kind of composite are you going to place? Is this is going to be nano hybrid composite, or is it going to be a different one? Yeah. So they know much more than before, and everything is about social media. But talking about ceramic and composite, I would like to mention one more thing, which which Javier probably mentioned a little bit, that with the composite we are able to save the tooth structure. But, but also one additional thing, because there, there was a trend with the ceramic veneers that they were doing the ceramic veneers without preparation. I would like to say that it's, it's, a, it's a really 
very difficult to make non ceramic non prep ceramic veneers because with non prep ceramic veneers it's a, it's a very very easy to emphasize and to make too big emergence profile gingivally and it's also very difficult to cement them without the rubber dam and we can experience big problem after cementing the veneers having them not in the right position or having them with too much emergence profile which is not really great and predictable for the gums while with the composite material it's not an issue because you can always improve it you can always correct emergence profile you can always add the composite or you can have less composite at the end using a profile contraangle which is which is a great contraangle to correct or all composite materials gingivally so so there is a big difference between non prep composite direct direct composite restorations direct composite veneers which is possible to to correct them anytime one year later half a year later 10 years later non prep ceramic veneers you have to replace them simply because if you make a mistake it's impossible to correct them yeah exactly yeah. ceramic has no there is no uh, forgiving on ceramics if there exactly. is an issue it's a uh, redo just uh, prep it again <laughs> and send it again to the technician so that's that's really it's it's a big point because indeed we are combining both things because people want more aesthetics. They want whiter teeth, brighter, but they don't want to prep their teeth. They want aesthetics without the prepping. And uh, and indeed, I agree that uh, no prep veneers are very, extremely difficult to be done in a in very good way. I mean, I know people that is doing non-prep veneers in a very, very good way, With but you need very good hands you need a very skilled technician making the veneers probably you need to work and i think for very extremely thin veneers if you're not doing platinum foil i think it's it's not going to work so it's it's going to be very very difficult of course there are some techniques that try to use lithium silicate in a very thin way and 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 actually reducing it you know like uh, like this in glue technique or things that you can get very thin lithium the silicate too which is more resistant and probably a bit more forgiving but but still it can break i mean it's it's very thin ceramic it's very very difficult and very stressful to bond to handle so it's it's a super stressful procedure you know because you know that at any moment any little mistake that you do during the procedure the veneer will break and and that's really it's super stressful i mean I don't know. I, I I've done different treat. Of course, I haven't been involved in, in in complex surgical treatment, so that's another dimension for me. But but I think that it's probably one of the most stressful moments in in the industry is when you are bonding veneers and especially thin veneers because it's you know that any any movement is and it's broken, and then it's like okay, now what? And if it happens with the first one, but if it happens with the last one. You know, it's like, okay, I have bonded everything and now the last one is broken. And let me tell you something. And if you never had a broken veneer, it's because you're not doing ceramic veneers. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So, I mean, we all had a case where we had a fracture, we had a problem. So, and that's it. I mean, it happens. And, and we need to, we cannot pretend that this is a, a fantastic and perfect and, and flawless thing. Absolutely not. And I 100% agree with Magic that composite in that way, it's fantastic because, okay, if I just made a little mistake and I need to correct it, I can always correct it. And it's fantastic for that. And now I see more and more patients after, for example, orthodontic treatment. We have a lot of, of these patients that need some smile improvements right it's not even that they want white teeth or they want but they have problems after the ortho treatment maybe there is some wear on the surface maybe the shape is is you know it's not perfect 
maybe there is a little space there that wants you want to be close because the ortho treatment is good, but it cannot be absolutely perfect, right? So there is always some slight things. And I see a lot nowadays this this issue, you know, that we need to finish the case because it, the end is not the ortho. It's like we need a little bit here, a little bit there. Maybe it's not a lot, but okay, we want to put a bit more anatomy here or there with just a little bit of enamel. And this is, for example, with, with Essentia, this is something I do a lot. I just take the, the, the enamel and only with enamel, just start playing a little bit, you know, adding a little bit here, there, just to improve the aesthetics without prep, without, you know, just to, to finalize the case, because this is what people is demanding too. So, and if you think about doing veneers or doing ceramic, yeah, it's, it's going to be, I mean, the known prep, as Magic said, I mean, it's not only, it's only in very specific cases that you really can do no prep because some cases, just the insertion path is totally impossible. You cannot do no prep. It's, there are some cases, and typically when you talk about non prep veneers, you always see this kind of cases where they have like conoid teeth or or teeth that are already they, they seem that they are prepped already, right? Because they, they they are quite straight or even you know uh, thinner on the incisal edge, and and they are very very easy to do without prep. But there is a big issue with a non prep when you have a normal tooth, because on the on the proximal areas, you cannot really go too too deep. You know, you cannot cover too much on the interproximal because there is basically no no way to insert the the veneer in place. And this is a huge problem and a huge limitation that the only way to overcome it is prep. Maybe it's only with discs, and sometimes it's like no no, but I only prep with disc. But yeah, but the disc is also <laughs> cutting tooth, right? I mean, yes, you are not using a burr anymore. I only use disc, but still, it's cutting down the enamel. So it, it, this is not you cannot say it's a non prep veneer because you are prepping the tooth. I mean, how much enamel are you removing with the disc? You can remove quite a lot of enamel too. So, and with composite is a real thing that it is non-prep. Non-prep means non-prep. So it is no disc, nothing. I just add enamel on top and then I'm reshaping things. But just that, you know, without the limitations of the insertion path, without all this, this thing. But, uh, but of course, I understand that, yeah, we need, also need to, to be trained and we need to try. We need to be really... Uh, handling the materials, you know, and learning how to work with them properly. And this is probably the limitation about having beautiful composites. But, I mean, if you learn the skills, you can do fantastic things with, with composite that can be maintained, that can be replaced, that can be repaired. And you can keep the patient with this for their lives, you know. Just uh, keep evolving, keep moving, keep being something alive, not not static, not completely static. I have no doubt that the composite is the future. Since you both are also doing courses and workshop, the, the topic, is there a way or would you recommend some courses for them or uh, spaces where they should really visit if they want to learn direct dentistry? I think we are both involved in this, in this uh, and, and you can find us in many places and different countries, I think, lecturing about and, and giving courses about this technique. So also about indirect too, I guess. Uh, we have a lot of people that that is doing beautiful, beautiful work. And yeah, by the way, actually in in, in, um, in December I will be in, in Kempten in, in Germany. Oh ah, nice. Yeah, I will I will have a lecture and a course there for the study club in Kempten and Yeah, this is following up with um, another lecture in a course that they gave in Stuttgart, 2020, so just before the, the, the lockdown, just before the COVID lockdown. I was there in Stuttgart. And, and yeah, I think that there is more and more interest for these techniques and this more advanced way of working with composite layering and, and achieving beautiful statics with composites. But I think a good way to find you is also to look at the GC headquarter in Leuven and to check when you are in Belgium, basically. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We have, I have courses scheduled in Belgium for sure with, with GC 
Yeah, and also with the local offices of GC in the different countries. So you can always ask them because uh, very often I'm, I'm traveling around Europe and, and doing some, some courses with different areas. So that, that could be an opportunity. And and besides that, we have, if, if you want to really run and, and have a course very, very soon, next month, at the end of next month, I will have a three days composite program in beautiful city of Barcelona. And and that's a, also a nice opportunity to to learn all this all about these techniques and, and layering. I think it's a nice experience. Three days is quite three a lot. days. Yes, three days. It's a three days course in Barcelona. Sounds a, sounds nice, huh? It's a it's, yeah. Actually, it really sounds nice because usually. I mean, Germany is a usual composite course is on the afternoon. It's either uh, for anteriors, uh, less likely about posteriors. It's kind of a pity that there aren't two or three day courses uh, about that. There are a lot of topics to cover. You know, if you want to really cover them properly, there is a lot of steps that you need to to cover. And, and, and you cannot, I mean, what I learned is you can never, you can never think that, everything is is known i mean you you sometimes you have someone coming to the course and they you might think that they know everything about bonding everything about the steps that they need to follow you know and they're just coming for learning how to layer the composite but the reality is that you also need to talk about these topics and and they are also interested because they always take a lot of tips a lot of things to improve because at the end of the day we are placing composite but there are a lot of steps that they they needed before the, the placement of the composite and all this these steps are absolutely critical on the longevity of those composites too so i think it's a lot of information that we need to understand that we need to learn and and having a good volume of practice during these days is, is also important you know because the first practice you do maybe it's not going to to be perfect but then you do another one then i mean so in three days, you have really time to develop, time to think about the content, and you can start discussing, asking questions, and everything becomes a more rich experience. The learning, I think, it's it's far far better than than just spending an afternoon or one day. What about you, Mache? We running the courses usually with the patients, so all the courses we running, we we have the the demo. We we try to. To show the patient, to, to explain the mocap procedure, to, to explain the planning, explaining the wax up, mocap, silicon index, and, and first two hours we spent with the with the demo and demonstration. And then usually we work on the models, and sometimes the courses are one or two days sometimes more we have also the aesthetic curriculum that consists of 18 days of courses in this curriculum we have direct restorations we have video elevation with composite restorations we have occlusion one and occlusion two courses and we have comp we have ceramic venue courses so quite complex course about the aesthetic dentistry run by five lectures in Krakow and Rome. This is a quite complex 18 days course that that lasts probably one and a half a year for the people. And, and during this period, they have to prepare their own work. And at the end of the story, they have to present the case and pass an exam. So, <laughs> and uh, they have also a kind of mentorship, one of the lecture. Uh, running the patient and running the case they can consult contact phone and understand the way and the possibility that they can treat the patient yeah so i, I think i think as as javier said uh, usually it's it's difficult to make everything in one day so so meeting the lecture through two, three days, or maybe coming back for more courses. It's more complex and it's it's great to show him the cases because every everybody of us has a mentors in dentistry. For me, great mentor in, in the ceramic material is uh, Marconi Castro, my mentor from Rome. 
I have different mentors in composite materials. And I have my mentor in functional dentistry, who is John Coyce in, in Seattle. I was For 10 years, I was going there for courses to finish with an exam and to finish with a mentor uh, exam this year. So I became the, finally the mentor of the Coyce Center in, in Seattle after 10 years of education. But, but it's, I think it's a great thing to come back to your mentor and uh, asking the questions and collecting the cases and improving your dentistry day by day in whichever age you are if you are 25 years old or if you are 55 years old you should improve your dentistry always because you if you don't educate yourself if you don't learn if you don't have a name for every year you are going back to the past and you need to go forward to the future every day step by step this is the way <laughs> that's the best closing word i could ever this imagine is the way. This is the way. <laughs> definitely we need, we need to get out of our comfort zone from time to time and learn new things and learn and improve always keep this hungry spirit you know for for more for learning and for improving that's really really important It was great that you spent to spend your Sunday night with me. <laughs> Usually, when the people are listening, they don't uh, sometimes don't realize uh, at which time we record it. But it was kind of still a okay time, I think. Midnight, yeah. almost midnight, <laughs> almost midnight. <laughs> that's okay. That's, that's normal. That's that's good time for Spain. <laughs> we can have dinner now. <laughs> <laughs> in Sevilla, okay. in Sevilla. Yes. Thanks for joining me and have a nice week. You too. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. Thank you very much, guys.